instead of having um, a first Rabbe Zubri, we'll start now with the Arno Wilders. Let's say the second brain of, of the Mars One project. You probably know Arno very well. And it will go more on the technical challenges and, and ideas on, on the trip itself. Arno, the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, conference. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about launching from Earth and landing on Mars. Uh, that's basically what I was asked to talk about too. So, before I talk about what kind of launches are currently available and uh, what kind of landing systems you need to go to Mars, we need to talk a little bit about what is currently going on within the space world. Because there is a big change going on. In the past, we saw that most of the projects were done by governments, and government paid uh, contracts were given to industry, and they would build it, and but everything would be run by government. But now we have a change. We know that the space shuttle has been retired. We know that currently the only way to go to the, to the International Space Station is through the Russian spacecraft Soyuz. So access to space is quite limited. Of course, there is this Chinese uh, Shenzhou spacecraft, which goes only to the Chinese uh, station. So there are some changes going on. And the main thing which is currently hampering the full buildup of structure in space is basically the price per kilogram. So a lot of companies are currently working to try to reduce the cost of bringing mass into space, which is one of the holy grails in the current uh, space world. And one of the most important uh, programs which has been in instigated the last couple of years is this COTS program. It's called Commercial uh, Orbital Transport System. And this is being set up by NASA. Basically what they want to do is they want to buy rights to the Inter International Space Station. They don't want to buy systems anymore. So what they have done is they came up with a program where companies could go come in and would tell on what kind of systems they would like to build, but they had to bring in 50% of the capital themselves. So NASA would provide half of the price and the companies had to do the other half. Which is really important because it's a completely different way of doing spaceflight compared to what was done in the past. And also what you saw in, in old programs is that the, in, the NASA management was really on top of everything in the program. And now with this COTS program, they're mainly following it and they can be asked for advice, which is a completely different way of doing uh, and also having the management of the system. So one of the companies is SpaceX. Uh, Elon Musk, who is the owner of this company, set it up in 2004 and basically is building a set of launchers which will become really capable and already are able to uh, bring cargo to the International Space Station. Uh, their capsule is called Dragon. Uh, I think most of you have already heard about this. They launch from Cape Canaveral, but they can also launch from uh, Vandenberg Station in uh, California and they're currently working on a third launch pad in uh, Texas. So they are basically the first ones who were able to bring cargo to the, to the International Space Station on a private basis. Of course they were being paid, but the whole the development of the rocket was done internally, in-house. You see some images here of the rocket itself, of the, the, the deployment of the solar rays, of how the capsule was captured by the arm uh, to the International Space Station, and how it came back. It's, it's the system which can also bring the capsule back to, to Earth. So, because NASA does not want to depend on only one provider for these uh, uh, cargo transport, they have also asked a second company called Orbital Sciences to develop a similar system. This is currently also in place and they're capable of bringing cargo to the ISS as well. They have the Taurus II uh, uh, rocket and the Cygnus capsule. And those are currently working and they're planning their second flight already in December this year. Now, due to the success of this commercial uh, cargo program, NASA decided to also do a crew program on the same basis. And that's currently in the process. They have asked for the final set of proposals from another, a couple of companies in the US to develop a system which can bring astronauts to the ISS. But those companies are also able to use those systems later to bring uh, people to other stations. For example, you know, I will talk a little bit about Bigelow. They have these plans to bring uh, inflatable space stations in space, and these systems can bring people there as well. Again, what is very important is that 
NASA is only paying for part of the development and then it will buy the rights. So they will not become owners of the complete spacecraft and they're not buying the spacecraft itself, they're buying the rights. And currently there are three uh, companies who are working on this. It's SpaceX, it's Boeing with their uh, capsule and there's a company called Sierra Nevada Corporation. Maybe you've seen this online. They, have, they are basically building a smaller uh, space shuttle system which can fly on one of their uh, launcher rockets being developed by uh, the United Launch Alliance in the US. So this is basically a couple of images. On the left you see an unfunded proposal by Blue Origin owned by Jeff Bezos, who is also owner of Amazon, who is, who is also in, the, in this game. Then on the second page, the second image, that's the Boeing spacecraft. Uh, the third is this space shuttle-like structure, which uh, is built by Sierra Nevada, and then the fourth one is SpaceX. Now, all those capsules need a launcher. And in the past, the two main launchers in the US are the Atlas V and the Delta IV. And those launches have been developed without thinking about uh, rating for a human crew. So what they have been asked to do by NASA is to have a look on what kind of systems they need to add to those rockets to make sure that they would be eligible for human flight. And that means that they have to look into, uh, for example, uh, if there's, if there's goes something wrong on the launch pad in the beginning, the crew need to be able to be expelled from the spacecraft and from the rocket itself. So that kind of analysis have, has been done by the company. And the good thing about these two launchers is, is that those two rockets have been used by the US to bring very expensive spy satellites into space. And the average cost of a spy satellite is, beyond, is between 1.5 and $2 billion. So those rockets need to be extremely reliable to bring that stuff into space. So that already gives you some confidence that those rockets could well be used by bringing humans into space as well. Then, the rocket we are currently as Mars One, uh, we will, this is our baseline rocket, it's the Falcon Heavy. It's in development at SpaceX. And what the good thing about this Falcon Heavy is, is that it can bring 53 tons in the low Earth orbit. I will give you a, a short a comparison in a later slide between the rockets, but this is a significant improvement from the rockets we currently have. Of course, we had the Energia in the past from Russia, which could bring 80 tons into a uh, long Earth orbit, but this rocket cannot fly at this moment anymore. So this is a very important part of our proposal to do Mars 1. And the good thing about this rocket is that it has three Falcon 9 cores. So Falcon 9 is already flying regularly, it's being tested, and it's really reliable until now, and it works with 27 engines. And the good thing about that is that if one or two engines fails in one of those cores, it can still reach orbit. There's no problem with that. There's another good thing which will enhance the capability of bringing mass to low Earth orbit, and that's what we call crossfeed. This rocket will be able to transfer propellant from the side cores to the middle core during the flight which means that you're able to drop those side boosters in an earlier stage in the launch uh, timeline. And that means that you can improve the total mass you get into low Earth orbit. So I put here the first launch beginning of 2014. I think that's a little bit too optimistic. Uh, it might well be end of 2014. Uh, but the developments are there. The Falcon 9 is flying regularly. And that means that they're quite close to implementing this rocket and it will more, like, more likely be ready for our own purposes for Mars 1. <coughs> so this is basically a comparison between the rockets which are currently existing and, and, and the ones which have just been retired. So you see quite clearly that the 53 tons is something which other rockets cannot do at the moment. If you look to what is the average uh, mass which can be brought to low Earth orbit, it's around 20 tons. Now, in the lower picture you will see uh, the Energia, and I just heard a rumor last week that the Russians are planning to bring Energia back online again, but we need to see how realistic this is and how much effort it will take to do this, but there seems to be some serious effort uh, behind this. Then another, I w I, in my first slide I said that one of the holy grails of spaceflight is to reduce the cost per kilogram we need to build in space. 
And one of the things we liked, we need to have in spaceflight is reusability. So the space shuttle was already reusable, more or less, because it took a lot of effort and a lot of time after landing to bring it again into a shape for the next launch. But what you really would like to do is to have a launch of a rocket and be able to use the same system maybe 10 days afterward and launch again. Now, one of the key issues here is that you need to bring back the stages of the rocket back to your launch site. And this is something what SpaceX is currently implementing in their Falcon 9 design. The good thing about that is that when you bring back your first stage again to Earth and you're able to refurbish it within a couple of days and do the reflight, then the cost per launch will dramatically decrease. And that's very important for what I said before. So they've done already a test with this um, reusability. And what they did is that during the last launch where they launched the Cassiopeia, a Canadian satellite into uh, Earth orbit, they reignited the first stage and tried to bring it back to space. And I'll show you an image where you see this first stage basically a little bit hoovering uh, a couple of meters uh, on, above the ocean uh, level. So they're really trying to get this done. And what I'm hearing and what people are saying is that this should be ready for complete implementation within a couple of years. And that means that the launch cost will dramatically decrease. In the future, he, he also would like to have the second stage be reusable. So he wants to fly that back to the launch site again as well. It's much more difficult because the second stage, of course, is, has a higher velocity already and is much farther uh, <coughs> off the atmosphere than the first stage is. Then there's this other development which is important because it shows that there's a shift in paradigm uh, going on in the space world and that's uh, Bigelow Aerospace. This is a company which basically bought a patent from NASA to build inflatable habitats for space. And what he's basically doing, he's building a, a habitat currently which will be connected to the International Space Station in 2016, which is inflatable. So because most of the structures which we bring to space, the size of that is limited by the fairing of the rocket. What you do is you have a system which inflates afterwards. So when you're in space, you inflate and the total volume of the, of the module is much larger than in the beginning. And this is as a very, uh, it's very important to have. So they're building, they have already built two of those uh, scale models. They have, they have been, they're currently flying around the earth. They launched five, six years ago and they're still working. They're not leaking, which is quite important. So with this prospect of having uh, such a module in, I, coupled to the ISS in 2015, 2016, this is really proving that inflatable uh, habitats work. So this is an overview of their largest. Uh, it's the, the volume, what you see on the, left, on the upper image, is as large as what's currently in the total volume of the ISS. So such a module would be really, really useful. And that a commercial space station, which they are currently uh, proposing, would look something like on the lower picture. Then, of course, there is some development in the capsules. Um, you see that the Russians are working on a replacement of the Soyuz. Uh, you have these American capsules which are coming online. You have the Chinese capsules online. So there is a large amount of development in all those systems which, need, which we need to bring people into space. Then another development, what's going on, and what's important, is the ability to have propellant in space. There is a huge discussion going on uh, in the space world whether we need either a very large rocket, like the space launch uh, uh, system in the US, which is extremely costly to build, or whether we need propellant depots into space. So what would be mean is that you don't need to bring all your propellant with your first launch, there is propellant already there, and you use that to go to Mars or to go to the moon or to go to other places in the solar system. And this is something which is currently in development uh, in NASA, but also in Russia. And there are a couple of issues with this, with this propellant uh, being in space, because those propellants are most of the time very cold. They're cryogenic uh, propellant, and they boil off. So if you wait a couple of months, you will lose a certain percentage of the propellant. And this is something which uh, needs to be fixed, and we're currently working on that. But it's an important development, and it will make building structures and building larger missions in space really uh, make it, will make that happen. 
Then another very important point uh, of Mars One is of course entry, descent and landing on Mars. There have been a, a couple of missions which successfully landed on Mars and they have used completely different systems to land those uh, elements on Mars. So we have the Mars Science Laboratory, we have the Mars Exploration Rovers, we have Pathfinder, we have Phoenix and we have Vikings. And they all used different systems. And this graph shows you a little bit on how that affected their path in the atmosphere. So on the, on the vertical scale you see the altitude from the uh, surface of Mars in kilometers. And on the uh, horizontal scale you will see the velocity. And you see that depending on what kind of systems and what kind of mass you want to land on Mars, there is a difference uh, what kind of speed you will have at a certain altitude above Mars. And I will come to that a little bit later. So Viking used a very common sense system, basically using parachutes and rockets. And that was, they were able to do that for a number of reasons. They had propulsion able to do that. And they uh, were light enough to implement it such that it could work on a rocket uh, with a fairing uh, size back then. Because the fairing size did also gives you a fixed uh, diameter of the heat shield. And the heat shield is very important. If you make your heat shield larger, you can land more massive systems on Mars. Now with the Mars Science Laboratory, this is a system which has a mass of around 900 to 1000 kilograms. And the older ways of landing on Mars with these airbag systems and with the parachutes didn't work anymore. Because the parachutes needed to be much bigger and you need to deploy those parachutes at supersonic speeds and if you have a size which is a little bit larger than 30, 34 meters, then those parachutes will just rip and it doesn't work. So they needed to come up with a different way of landing this kind of mass on Mars. And what they basically implemented was the sky crane. Um, more, I'm sure that most of you have seen this. This is basically the crane with a propulsion system which was hoovering 10 meters above the surface, would lower the rover on a, a, a hinge and then it would just cut away when it was landed and then the propulsion system would just fly away to make sure that it was not contaminating the landing site. So this is a completely new system. The problem with this landing system is that it cannot be used for landing um, masses on Mars larger than say 2000 kilograms. So you need to come up with a system which basically works like with two systems. So you have a, a very <coughs> large heat shield which can consist of a fixed part and an inflatable part. And the second thing you need is retropropulsion during supersonic flight. Those are the two main things which need to be implemented to land large masses on the surface of Mars. Now, a lot of people say that this has never been done before. And it, to land these systems on Mars, this has not been done before. But the technology development for retropropulsion in supersonic flight and also these inflatable structures, that has been going on already for quite some time. So I will show you some examples for that. This is one of these inflatable decelerators which have been proposed to be used in supersonic flight but also in hypersonic flight uh, during entry in Mars. And it's basically a system which inflates just before you enter the atmosphere of Mars. And it will give you a large surface area which will be used by the landing system to, with friction to decelerate your system. Uh, this has been tested, I think, last year on a hyperbolic flight on Earth and it was very, it worked perfectly and they were able to follow the system up to the uh, impact on the ocean. So that worked perfectly. So this is a technology which is coming online quite quickly and could be one of the possible uses uh, for landing systems on Mars. Then there's a lot of talk about supersonic retropropulsion as well. And this has been tested already in the 60s. Not many people know this, but in the 60s there were big plans of bringing people to Mars as well and use it also of bringing people from space uh, on high uh, velocity um, entries back to Earth. And retropropulsion was very important back then. So they were testing a lot of these systems. And you see already on the right side, this is an image of this Falcon 9 first stage. This has used retropropulsion in supersonic flight to decelerate the first stage and to bring it back to Earth. So these kind of developments are going on and more than likely will be ready for use of this flight when Mars 1 will need it. And then another part which is important for bringing uh, people 
to Mars when everything, when the base is there, you need to bring people to Mars. You need to have some orbital assembly because you will not be able to launch the complete system which will bring people to Mars in one go. So you will need to be able to connect uh, uh, propellant tanks, uh, rocket stages, you need to be able to connect them in low Earth orbit. And this is something which we have been doing already for say 30 to 40 years with the Mir space station, with the International Space Station and now also with the Chinese. So there is a lot of experience on how to connect uh, launches and how to connect systems in space to ensure that your spacecraft, which will bring you to Mars, will be ready. And that's basically what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Time for questions. Uh, these inflatable modules, what materi material is that going to be? And how do I have to look at it? I mean, it's not going to fit into an envelope and then uh, you have a balloon, but, but uh, no, no. how is how's that going to... How is it going to function? The, the, the inflatable structures which are currently being used by Bigelow are being built up of different Kevlar uh, structures. Because, of course, when you're in low Earth orbit, you will have the problem of micrometeorites. And the good thing about these inflatable structures is that they're more sturdy compared to the modules which are currently connected to the ISS. So they should be able to withstand those micrometeorites better than, uh, yeah, than those modules. Other questions? Um, one of the options you showed up there, I think it was a 265 metric ton, um, and it was labelled MTR at the top. I can only assume that's nuclear thermal rocket. Yeah, this was a study uh, uh, done by NASA, I think, five years ago, where they tried to see uh, what kind of systems you would need for different kind of landing masses. And indeed, one of the discussions which is taking place in NASA is how do you bring those kind of masses to and you need to propel them as well from Earth to Mars. And one of the issues indeed to have a nuclear thermal rocket to do that. But there is currently no development going on within NASA itself from a technical point of view to make this happen. Can we use inflatable structures in the Mars One uh, habitat? <coughs> well, it's part of the Mars One habitat. Okay. So the inflatable structures on the side, I saw no model here anymore, it's gone. But uh, when you have, when you see the capsules on a, on a row, yeah. then on the back you see these inflatable yeah, structures. Okay. And those are, yeah. <coughs> they're different inflatable structures from what's being used in space, but, yeah. Once yeah. landed, which kind of energy supply are you going to use? The energy supply is being made out of solar, uh, rolls of solar cells, yes. We will have a lot of them. Because we're currently baselining that it should give you enough power as well during these global uh, uh, dust storms on Mars. So it will be quite extensive uh, on the surface. Yeah, a lot of robotic <coughs> cleaning uh, of the solar cells to avoid uh, deposit of dust. We saw it on the... On True. The but I don't think, <coughs> from my point of view, it does not need to be robotic. It can be people. can be people, yeah, why not? Um, but there is also another effect which we've been seeing on uh, the Mars Exploration Rovers, which was quite unexpected, is that you have these dust devils on Mars, and they're cleaning, say, once every five, six months, they're cleaning the solar rays of these rovers. And one of these rovers, uh, I think a year ago, had the same power as when it just landed. It was quite, quite amazing. So there are some natural ways of cleaning. Of course, you do not depend on that. But, um, yeah, it can be robotically cleaned, but it can also be manually cleaned. I don't see an issue with that. I would say, what is going to be next? Because uh, are you going to land in a place where this item is going to be extracted? What is the process for that? There are, uh, our landing site is not, we don't have a landing site, of course, but we need to take care of a couple of things. First of all, there is this planetary protection issue where uh, humans are not supposed to land in specific areas on the planet of Mars where people might think life could evolve. So those are also the places where there is a huge amount of water. However, when we saw the results of Curiosity, uh, I think half a year ago, it shows that in almost everywhere on Mars, there is in the dust around two to 10% of water involved. And that amount of water can be used and extracted from the dust to be used for the humans. 
This is a, this is a, uh, a process which has been running on Earth already for, since the 17th century. It's a very simple chemical process. Okay. Yeah, digging. Digging, you dig, digging, you digging, yeah. you heat it up, and water can be extracted. Yes. When Curiosity found that there was 2% water in the soil, it also found that the soil was actually poisonous for humans. And what are you yes. going to do about this? Well, first of all, you, you, well, if you look to the complete system, which will extract water from the dust, there will also be a filter in place to ensure that there is no dust. So when you are removing that from the water, you're fine. But with respect to plants that you're growing into this soil? Uh, the, okay, we have to be really careful on how we are planning to do that, because there are some ways of not using the soil at all and do it hydro hydroponically. Mm -hmm. Then you don't need any soil to grow plants. Um, but there also have also been tests already on Earth where they used Mars-like soils and they were able to grow tomatoes and potatoes out of it. We need to be very careful that when you go to Mars and you, you look at one site, you don't generalize it all over the planet. Okay. <clears throat> so on Mars we need the oxygen, but also nitrogen. Oxygen we uh, uh, have from splitting the water, but from where we take uh, uh, nitrogen? Well, nitrogen is available in some of the minerals which are on Mars. But there might also be a possibility, if that's needed for the first 10 years, to bring that along ourselves. So uh, w this, of course, needs to be studied much in more detail. We don't have a final way of how we do this, but this can be solved quite easily. Uh, last question. I just want to go back to these inflatable modules. When they're deflated, what, what size do they have uh, compared to when they're inflated? There is a size increase. Uh, it depends on what system you use. Um, if you use those which are on the surface, they can be really small. And they can, I think it's a factor of 10 in, in difference. When you talk about the one which has been used for the international, will be used for the International Space Station, there the percentage is, I think, 30 percent, 40 percent. Yeah. I have many questions, but I will take the, the short question about the water recirculation. You can reuse the water a lot and yes. you'll have to try reuring the nose, these kind of things. And also, I think you will have to, to shield for radiation and take some water with you in the first place anyhow. Yeah. So how much of the water you think that you will be able to reuse? Well, we don't want to have, uh, we don't want to put a lot of effort into making sure that we have 99% of reusability. So we will bring some water out, but we will also take a lot of water out of the soil. Sure, that's all. And, and that's so, sure. so what we want to do there is we want to make use as much as possible the resources which are already available on Mars itself to bring as mi minimum as possible there. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this fantastic talk. <laughs>